everybody we'll just give everybody uh, the opportunity to to log in um so we'll start shortly Just to repeat, if you have uh, just joined us, welcome to the tonight's event on contemporary diplomacy in action. We will start in a minute or two. We're just allowing the audience to, to join us in the, the online room, and then we'll make a start. Great, another few seconds and then we will we will get underway. Super. Well, we'll make a start. Um, my name is Jonathan Hill. I am Director of the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies at King's College London, and I am delighted to welcome you to the first event in our calendar of talks and presentations for this new academic year on the Contemporary Diplomacy in Action, New Perspectives on Diplomacy. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to our chair for this evening, uh, Nicholas Hopton. Um, but before I do, just a few words on how uh, this, uh, this uh, panel discussion will work. Um, uh, the panelists will uh, take it in turns to uh, give their presentations, uh, and then you will we'll also have some thoughts from, from our chair. And then the floor will be open to questions uh, from, from you, the members of the audience. If you do have a question, please can you post it in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen, please the Q&A box rather than the, the, the chat box, and we will get to those uh, at the appropriate time once everybody has presented. Please feel free to post your question whenever it occurs to you, you don't have to wait to the end, um, just keep them coming in as, uh, as, as our presenters are speaking. Okay, our chair for this evening is uh, Nicholas Hopton. Delighted to, to welcome him uh, to the Institute and to King's College London. Um, Nicholas has had a long and distinguished career in what is now the Foreign Commonwealth uh, and Development Office. He joined in 1989 and served in a number of embassies uh, uh, around the world. He has served also as ambassador in Iran, Qatar, Yevon and most recently in Libya, so has spent quite a lot of time uh, in and around uh, the Middle East. He has also served in a, a national security capacity in the cabinet officer in the cabinet office and as the private secretary to the Minister of Europe. So he is very well versed in how Britain conducts its foreign policy uh, in this part of the world and uh, able to comment on diplomacy in the 21st century. Um, it's my, my very great pleasure, therefore, to, to hand over to Nicholas, who will guide you for, through this evening's discussion. Professor Hill, thank you, thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction and for inviting me along to chair this evening's event. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. 
um, for what I think will be uh, a very stimulating and interesting uh, discussion um, following the presentations uh, by the panelists, who are uh, very distinguished uh, observers, academics of the situation in modern diplomacy, uh, which has evolved massively during my own career. Um, and I'll be happy to say a few words um, if, if useful about that as we go through later on. Um, but I, th I think, uh, as I hope you've all seen, we've got uh, uh, quite a, a tight lineup to get us going. We're going to start in a moment with uh, the presentation of the two volume book, uh, New Perspectives on Diplomacy. And one of the editors, uh, Claire York, will lead us off with that. Um, Claire is, let me just say a few words about Claire, is an author and academic, specializes in empathy and emotions in international relations, politics, leadership and strategy. Um, currently leading a Marie Curie Fellowship, um, which is funded by the European Commission. And she's looking at empathy and international security at the University of Southern Denmark. So our panelists are joining us from various corners of the world, um, and I'll come on to another one even further away in a moment. Um, but to uh, can give you a, a last few words on Claire's uh, career to date, she was previously a Henry Kissinger postdoctoral fellow at uh, Yale, and she gained her PhD from the Department of War Studies. Uh, before academia, she worked on security and defence at Chatham House and in the Euro UK Parliament. So Claire will be leading us off in a second, and then we will go to two presentations of two chapters from the book, which I would encourage you all, of course, to get the, uh, the books and to read all of them. But we're giving you a bit of a taster with two chapters, particularly tonight, and a focus on the Middle East uh, specifically. Um, and the first presentation will be made by Nagar. Um, her co-presenter, uh, Inga Traurig, cannot join us, unfortunately, this evening. Um, but uh, Nagar, Anga, who uh, is going to talk to us about the chapter, the Middle East and North Africa in the 21st century, an analysis of social media impact and corresponding diplomatic trends. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about Naga Anga, she is the director for multilateral initiatives for the Democracy and Human Rights Directorate at the US National Security Council. So we've got transatlantic perspectives coming in here very strongly. Um, obviously strongly linked to the White House. Nagar spent over 15 years with the US Department of State, where she represented the US on complex bilateral and multilateral negotiations. Um, she advised on issues related to the G7 and the UN Security Council. Peacekeeping, sanctions, counterterrorism, and anti-corruption, and she coordinated international donor and assistance efforts in Middle East and North Africa and South Asia. Uh, Nagar's originally from California, and holds an MA and an MBA from American University and is a part-time PhD candidate at King's London. Most recently she was a full-time PhD student with the Department of War Studies before she returned to America in 2021. And during her time in London, she was a GTA with the Department of Security Studies and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies and a senior editor with Strife Journal. She's also the co-founder of the Middle East Research Group, which is a PhD working group in the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies. So um, the second presentation will be given to us by Dr. Samia Puri, who is in Singapore this evening. So as I say, uh, we are drawing on expertise from around the globe. Sa Samia is uh, gonna talk to us about the chapter, engaging with proxy groups and indirect state influence in Ukraine and Syria. Um, he, uh, I can tell you, uh, is currently senior fellow at the IISS Asia office uh, in Singapore, as I said, um, and he's covering hybrid warfare. He's also a visiting, le visiting lecturer in war studies, and he previously taught at King's uh, between 2015 and 18. And earlier in his career, uh, Dr. Puri served in the Foreign Office, and uh, he covered their counterterrorism peace processes, and also was seconded to the OSC monitoring mission in the Ukraine. Uh, he's authored three books, um, Pakistan's War on Terrorism, published by Routledge in 2011, Fighting and Negotiating with Armed Groups, again Routledge, uh, 2016, and The Great Imperial Hangover, is the third book, 
published by Atlantic in 2020. And that's published in the USA as the Shadows of Empire. So um, I think that is hopefully um, shows we've got a very expert panel who uh, we're all looking forward very much, I'm sure, to hearing what they have to say about their chapters and then into uh, um, and what will no doubt be a vibrant discussion. So let me, uh, without further ado, pass over to Claire, Dr. Claire York, to uh, talk about the book uh, in general from her perspective as the editor. Over to you, Claire. Uh, thank you so much um, for hosting us and for inviting us to be here. I will apologize if my internet is a little bit unstable. Um, so do just let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Um, so I'm here on behalf of my two co-editors as well, Dr. Alistair Massa and Professor Jack Spence. And we were really thrilled with these two volumes on new perspectives on diplomacy to bring together such a brilliant group of scholars, practitioners and experts. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with everyone um, and uh, to be supported as well by IB Taurus and Bloomsbury Press. And I'm not going to speak for very long because the focus of this event is obviously on the chapters by Samir and Negar and Inga. Um, but very briefly, in five minutes, I want to give a brief overview of the core themes of both of these volumes. So the aims of these books were really to talk about the enduring relevance and importance of diplomacy. And we wanted to offer new insights and new perspectives and reveal the diversity and the breadth of expertise that there is in this field. And in particular from King's College London, anyone who looks through the contents page We'll see that a large number of our contributors do come from um, King's College London and reveal really the diversity of expertise and scholarship that there is within the department there. Um, we have IR theorists, we have um, historians, we have practitioners, all bringing their new insights and perspectives to these volumes. And you'll also notice there's no one methodological approach. The aims of these volumes was not to give one prescription of how we do diplomacy, but really to look at how it can be done in different ways and what that reveals. Um, so all of the volumes, both volumes um, combine theory and practice. It's both about what diplomacy means in theory when we think about it in the most abstract and broadest sense, but also what does it mean for those who are on the front line, for our diplomats, for our policy makers, for our politicians, um, for those who are really involved in bringing diplomacy um, to reality, to putting it into practice. And the core themes of these books are really that diplomacy is an imperative of international relations. Often it's seen as the poor cousin. We often focus on security or defense, on conflict, but diplomacy has enduring relevance. It's something we need even more now, um, a focus on um, dialogue, on representation, on engagement, on negotiation in the international arena. And one of the other themes that we really look at is how that's evolving and changing. And certainly we see some of the core tenets of diplomacy that have been a part of scholarship since scholarship on diplomacy began continuing, but we see new and evolving themes such as the rise of non-state actors, the importance of people outside the state in influencing the direction of policy and politics. We look at themes that are really growing in salience such as climate change, technology, social media, and how they have an impact on what diplomacy means, both for how we study it and for how we put it into practice. The book captures a lot of these and tries to put them in dialogue with one another, but it's obviously not exhaustive. Um, and there are some areas that maybe we haven't focused on as much, but the idea is really to spark a wider discussion about what these mean for the future of diplomacy, what they mean for how we understand it, and for what we should be looking at. Um, among the elements as well is a need for greater multilateralism, for more multipolarity, for discussion between different actors, and to understand the roles that smaller states can also play within this field. And we're seeing this particularly now when there is a kind of shaking up of power um, and where different states um, lie is that we need to be talking more 
to all contributors to the international um, arena and to the role and contributions that they can play. Um, we hope with these books that it will be the start of a dialogue and um, we really want it to be something that will point to why we need to continue thinking about how we how we study it, how we put it into practice, especially in light of events that we're seeing um, on the global stage right now. Um, with that, I want to learn more about the books um, in the questions and answers afterwards and to go more into some of the themes that we uh, cover in the discussion. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, thank you for that overview and um, I'm sure people will want to pick up on some of those uh, those thoughts. First we're going to, before we open it out more broadly, uh, we'll go to Negar now to talk about the chapter on uh, Middle East uh, and North Africa in the 21st century, an analysis of social, me middle, social media impact and corresponding diplomatic trends. Over to you Negar. Hello uh, and, and good evening, good afternoon. Um, it's lovely to be here today. Unfortunately, my co-author was unable to join due to a last minute emergency, but I'm happy um, to talk through what we envisioned um, together for this chapter. Um, as Claire mentioned, when she first approached us uh, to write a chapter on uh, the Middle East and North Africa, um, uh, we definitely spent quite a bit of time together to sort of uh, think through what would be important. There's been quite a bit that's been written about the role of diplomacy in the Middle East, North Africa region. Um, and we wanted to ensure that we were able to truly um, reflect upon the inflection point that we are in now um, in the 21st century in terms of of the role of, of diplomacy, the role of engagement with civil society by diplomats um, and, and the other way around. Um, and quite a bit has been written about uh, diplomacy in terms of it being an art um, more than a science and it's often dependent on an individual leader and their perception or context. So what we tried to do was um, look at truly the, the rapid changes in communications um, and communication technologies and that the impact that it's had on diplomatic practices in the Middle East, North Africa region. Um, so I will just uh, for, for this evening provide a, a very quick overview of the chapter and, and we really look for, I really look forward to, um, to answering some of your questions. Um, as this is a continuously evolving space. Um, so the chapter first uh, discusses the adoption of these new communication technologies for political mobilization in the MENA region. Um, and it situates sort of the social media hype in, in 2011 in sort of that broader context. So uh, sort of what was occurring uh, around the Arab Spring and a bit before the Arab Spring. Um, and so we reflect upon, you know, what was, there were many sort of, um, uh, it was dubbed in many different ways, but the sort of Silicon Valley effect. Um, so aside from this policy articulation, sort of the way social media channels had added this new element to um, the role of, of public diplomacy and public diplomacy practice, it sort of enabled that two-way interaction between foreign ministries and their social media followers, many of whom were either average citizens or activists. Um, and so the, the strategy offers sort of this, the prospect of meaningful engagement between um, the foreign ministries and this attentive international public, both from listening and learning from foreign perspectives, but also allowing for that engagement to advocate for, for policy support. The, the second uh, portion of, the of, the, of this particular chapter describes the technological developments in the context of US diplomacy, sort of examining how previous US administrations responded to the realization that social media was a powerful tool for not only informing, but also mobilizing mass audiences. Um, it was, 
you know, there, there was various different inflection points uh, throughout that we examined. Um, we, we held some interviews um, with individuals and, and sort of expound upon that in, in the book chapter. Um, and, and thirdly, it examines the, the region-wide instability, which began in 2011, but it also examines sort of the US response. It addresses how these new communication technologies um, have altered the basic patterns of diplomatic practices since the Arab Spring. Again, sort of demarches still exist, you know, even if digitalized demarches, um, but in doing so, this new technology allowed for uh, this learning experience um, and this engagement with young people and young people being um, having the, the platform to express their views and express um, sort of what they were seeing um, in the region. And so, uh, what, again, what we try to reflect upon is this evolution of, of technology and digital diplomacy. Um, become this complementary tool for traditional diplomacy, um, which many have dubbed as public diplomacy 2.0. Um, you know, some are now uh, sort of discussing how we're in a new evolution phase um, where it's public diplomacy 3.0, where there are more pluralities of players that meet and discuss issues, um, where technology has dispersed power to people or groups based on their, their strength of their networks. Um, you know, since we, we wrote the chapter, there's been quite a bit of, of discussion with regards to the Clubhouse app and its role in the Middle East and allowing for a different kind of dialogue um, uh, now in this sort of audio context. Now, you know, many argue Clubhouse has now disappeared, but it again allowed for um, activists, scholars to expound upon different views and allowing sort of diplomats to be able to engage in that space. So um, the, the chapter uh, attempts to sort of break some of these barriers, talk through uh, the role of diplomacy in the MENA region and sort of reflect upon the times are, are changing um, and leaders are having to engage with their global citizens um, in, in real time, um, not allowing for that cushion of time that used to exist when uh, things would play out on TV and it would take just a, a little bit of time allowing for diplomats to, to have a, a more thorough response. Um, but that is a very quick overview of the chapter and, and happy to answer um, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigar. Um, very tantalizing uh, overview of your chapter um, and there's lots more in there. I know um, that uh, those who've read it or will read it uh, will get a lot out of it. Before we open up for questions and answers after the next presentation, let me now introduce Dr. Samad Puri, uh, who will talk to us about the chapter he, he has authored in the, in the book called Engaging with Proxy Groups and Indirect State Influence in Ukraine and Syria. So uh, Samir, over to you. Thank you. Well, Nicholas, thank you very much. And thanks also to the editors of the volume, to Claire, who's here, to Alistair, to uh, Professor Spence, and to, uh, to the department for hosting uh, this talk. Um, so we're going to head straight over to a very different area of diplomatic challenge, and that's the challenge of dealing with, with wars that are very difficult to end. And uh, I begin the chapter with the, with the observation that diplomacy has not enjoyed a stellar record in bringing to end uh, complex wars. Uh, the Middle East is no stranger to those sorts of wars. And one of the reasons that diplomacy struggles to get a grip uh, with regards to conflict uh, termination is that uh, it's actually a question that I encountered quite a lot when I was previously teaching at King's. Students would sometimes debate, well, is this a civil war or is this a proxy war? Well, there's no reason why an armed conflict can't have properties of both civil war and proxy war. And this merging, this sort of uh, this entwining of, of the nature of the different types of challenges that one might face in, in confronting uh, an armed conflict uh, has actually made a number of conflicts, not only in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world, really quite intractable. Uh, because a lot of uh, conflict resolution uh, intervention uh, thought processes, techniques, and methodologies, well, they're, I guess, more attuned to dealing with a, a civil war in which there is perhaps 
uh, a, a secessionist faction and a government to negotiate between. But when you add in uh, the pride of uh, neighboring powers and great powers that have intervened, whether overtly or covertly, uh, then the, the possibilities for bringing conflicts to an end uh, can sometimes decrease. And this is certainly something uh, that has been seen in conflicts uh, that I look at in this chapter uh, in Syria and in Ukraine. So quick pause for a moment, because clearly Ukraine is not uh, anywhere near the Middle East. Uh, I decided to put these two examples together because I had some direct experience uh, of working on, on each of them. Uh, back when I worked at the Foreign Office, uh, I spent a year, as Nicholas mentioned in the intro, in East Ukraine. And that's where I saw uh, the way in which, well, people all talked about hybrid war. They talked about the way Russia was using uh, modern tools of subversion and uh, internet-based uh, propaganda. Well, actually, what I thought was one of the most interesting hybridities in the Ukraine scenario was between the sponsorship of proxy arm groups and the diplomatic top cover that the Russian government was providing uh, to those proxy factions to allow for their strategy in Ukraine of annexing Crimea and stoking an ongoing conflict in the Donbass uh, to persist. Well, what did that mean in practice? What that meant was Russia superficially signed up to conflict resolution uh, agreements, specifically in a regional organization called the OSCE, and then directly contributed to the OSCE's unarmed observation mission, which I was a part of. That was one arm of the Russian government. And of course, in the UN Security Council, uh, the Russians, uh, the diplomats there would, of course, shrug their shoulders and say, well, what's happening in Ukraine is a civil war. It's nothing to do with us. Whereas, of course, on the ground, uh, the Russians were sponsoring and indeed uh, providing direct resources and personnel to the so-called secessionist groups that had taken hold in the Donbass territories of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, specifically, give you one concrete example of what this sort of looked and felt like. Uh, in February 2015, whilst I was still there, there was a last sort of major battle that resulted in a change of territory, a city called Debaltseva. Exactly the same time that the Russian-backed separatists were mounting this offensive, uh, actually engaging in street-to-street -street fighting and the Ukrainian armed forces withdrawing, Russian diplomats were signing up to the second of two peace deals, uh, the Minsk Protocol Part Two, which actually stipulated for the withdrawal of armed forces. Russia did this at the same time, and it did this in a way to, on the battlefield, increase the pressure against the Ukrainian government. So the Ukrainian diplomats negotiating this uh, peace deal felt that their backs were against the wall, felt they needed to sue for peace at, at any cost at that particular moment in time. And lo and behold, the resulting uh, peace agreement, Minsk II, was quite favorable to, to Russia's interests and it succeeded in shielding their proxies. So why did I package that example with the example of Syria in this chapter? Well, I thought it was quite instructive because uh, certainly with regards to the Russian intervention in Syrian conflict, which as we remember became overt and involved the deployment of a Russian task force uh, in September, 2015, um, the Syrian government appears to have advised and helped the Assad government uh, to do something rather similar in relation to this uh, fighting, talking, proxy war sort of equation uh, as it unfolded in Syria. And give you one specific example here. Uh, those of you who followed the Syrian conflict for the last, if not the last decade, then at least the last five years, might remember that there in 2016, uh, the diplomats involved in the peace process around Syria negotiated some cessation of hostilities uh, these were not peace deals to end the fighting, uh, but these represented the best efforts of, I think John Kerry was Secretary of State, uh, of the diplomatic community to try to bring some kind of order to the chaos in Syria. Well, that's the same year that the Russians and the Syrian Air Force then leveled Aleppo, 2016. And once again, this uh, combination of fighting and talking at the same time, talking in the, in the sort of the halls of of diplomatic power, whether it's a regional diplomatic organization, whether it's the UN Security Council, whether it's through bilateral ad hoc 
uh, diplomatic groupings, while at the same time uh, supporting factions to fight on your behalf, empowering others to fight on your behalf, or perhaps even lending your own uh, military power to support. So I'm going to wrap up uh, some observations from my chapter, which I do hope you get to read alongside all the other uh, fantastic contributions uh, in these two volumes. Just a few observations, one of which is that um, I described that proxy war and civil war are not mutually exclusive. Uh, there are quite a large number of conflicts around the world, not just in the Middle East, where there's the overlap of both of these uh, characteristics. And I think um, diplomatic interventions in armed conflicts are always going to struggle with that mix. It's not a new mix necessarily, but one of the reasons why I think this mix is particularly, uh, particularly troubling uh, for, for conflict resolution approaches uh, at the moment is the fact that uh, there is much greater geopolitical competition in the world between what some people like to call middle powers. Um, I don't think the era of US unipolarity is all of a sudden ended, uh, but clearly the world and geopolitics is a very changed place uh, compared to you know, as recently as five or 10 years ago, when unipolarity and sort of the US ability to uh, censure other powers from intervening in conflicts was quite strong. Now we have multiple conflict interventions by countries like Russia, also a country like Turkey, not only in the Middle East, but also in Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, of course, within the Middle East, multiple interventions, uh, sometimes very much under the radar by Iran, but also a uh, intermittent bombing campaign by Israel in, in Syria against Hezbollah targets. So actually, all of a sudden, the notion of, of state intervention in armed conflicts is, is actually rather more diverse and rather, I think, more challenging to understand than it was perhaps a decade ago. Some of those interventions are direct and they're declared, such as, for example, Saudi, uh, Saudi, Saudi intervention in Yemen. Uh, but others uh, under the radar are done without admitting that they're happening and are done through the use of, of proxies, uh, perhaps directly supported on the ground by intelligence officers or members of your own armed forces. Um, and the goal of these interventions, this is my last sort of comment before I, I sort of bring my, my piece to an end. The goal of these interventions is not necessarily always to win. Sometimes, and this is where uh, the Ukraine example is, I think, really instructive. The goal for Russia is just to perpetuate the conflict at a certain level, whether that's to achieve a particular policy goal. In this case, it's to uh, fatally compromise Ukraine's ability to claim it has sovereign control over its full territory, or whether it's simply to stay involved in the fight, to bleed an opponent, uh, to perpetuate an interstate rivalry in a third party state. Sometimes methods of proxy intervention and indirect state influence are such that they can actually be executed at a tolerable or low cost for the intervener, but at a horrendous cost for the, for the, the country that's the subject of the conflict and potentially at a fatal cost to diplomatic efforts that are attempting to bring order to the chaos. So I'll, I'll end my comments there. Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Puri. Um, very stimulating uh, introduction to your chapter and <clears throat> I'm sure um, some in the audience will want to uh, pick up on some of those thoughts and observations, uh, some of which are uh, fairly, fairly polemical and, and challenging, which is, which is the purpose of sessions like this, of course, uh, to make us think <clears throat> and uh, think out of the box. Um, I would encourage people online to now start, if they haven't already, putting their comments, questions uh, into, the, uh, into the chat, um, and uh, we will pick them up um, after... Um, the, the next uh, intervention, which is actually from me. Um, I've been asked to <clears throat> um, offer some thoughts and uh, observations uh, from on what I've heard and read uh, from our two presentations um, in, the, in the light of my own uh, experience uh, as, as a British diplomat over the last uh, 32 years. Um, let me just start with a couple of thoughts on uh, Claire's introduction things that struck me particularly. Um, her, the, the editors suggest that diplomacy may now be more reactive um, than about shaping events. Um, I think that is highly debatable. 
and may be correct, but there are lots of examples too where diplomacy still matters as Claire uh, highlighted, diplomats are still perhaps as necessary, if not more necessary than ever. It's the nature of the, uh, the trade, the trade craft and how diplomats operate that may be evolving, but do they still have the potential to shape events? I think that's an interesting question to consider. I was also struck by the observation about um, uh, the present situation being characterized by multipolarity and uh, a certain reluctant multilateralism. Now these things ebb and flow in my experience. And I recall when I was in Paris um, in 2003, immediately after the second uh, Iraq war, um, how Jack Chirac was particularly uh, assertive on this point about uh, multipolarity being the new order um, after a decade of a very um, unipolar uh, US post-Cold War dominance. Uh, perhaps this ebbing and flowing has been um, part of that trend um, since the French intervention. Um, obviously, the Arab Spring, so-called, and a very, very messy decade in that region, but also globally, um, have also contributed to what feels now like a very fragmented international system. Um, and um, is that irrevocable? Or is that something that um, uh, that Western uh, countries seeking to uh, to operate within an international rule of law and to assert values which are considered shared and important? Is that something they can work within or is it is it now becoming too messy? Another question, I think. Nagar, uh, in her presentation, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've had quite a lot of experience in the last 10 years from a very low base with social media. I am not a techie person, but I've, like many of my colleagues in diplomacy, particularly in the British and American systems, we have had to learn to be um, tech savvy in a new way. Um, it's social media has certainly added to the diplomatic toolbox. Um, I would highlight the use of WhatsApp, which um, can uh, sometimes feel like the main channel of modern diplomacy, particularly in fast moving conflict uh, environments. Um, a lot of communication happens there. But also there are other uh, platforms, perhaps some of them more securely encrypted, such as um, perhaps Wicker or uh, Signal, which are widely used by ambassadors and other diplomats to communicate, um, and also by uh, leaders and, and powerful figures within, within countries. So uh, that is a totally new dimension to how we communicate and operate with people. Um, and and I, I'm very pleased that Nagar brought that out clearly. There are tensions, of course, and, and I think um, new difficulties arise because of this new environment we have to operate in. So whenever one is actually trying to um, use the social media available, uh, one has to, as a diplomat, has to think, are you communicating and broadcasting a message or are you engaging? And I think Nagar mentioned this, and I, and I think the reality is that uh, and I, perhaps I'm doing an injustice, but my sense was that um, the chapter uh, Nagar and Inga wrote would like to see more engagement uh, from uh, diplomats and governments through social media rather than just broadcasting and communicating. The problem with that is um, there are huge resource implications and in if you're going to engage properly and meaningfully with a wider, much wider public. Um, and there are lots of risks. Um, I, I must admit, I tend to, as an ambassador, avoid um, engaging uh, in particular detail on public social media platforms. Um, my experience suggests that it, uh, there are occasions when it's appropriate, but actually for many other occasions when a debate online uh, with a wide public, um, it can be counterproductive and can also uh, um, uh, backfire. Uh, and part of part of this is about risks. Um, so I, I, I agree with uh, Nagar that uh, and Inga in their chapter that it's very it's not possible to be effective as a diplomat if you uh, just operate on a whim. Um, if you if you communicate um, frequently and without um, careful preparation and thought uh, as to the impact of what you're saying. Uh, you're operating on an unregulated, largely unregulated uh, forum. And, um, and it's slightly to one side, but I recall 
uh, a very good colleague of mine, uh, an ambassador in Qatar, a US ambassador, um, who, who was a very, very effective uh, social media communicator. Um, but at a certain point she chose, because of the change of, um, of party in the White House, um, which was not uh, one she was sympathetic to, she, she chose to uh, make very clear her views about the new incumbent um, and tweeted. And I remember seeing one morning, I'd moved on from Qatar, I was in Iran then, but reading uh, a, a tweet from my, uh, my colleague uh, to the effect of waking up another morning and another uh, car crash tweet out of the White House. And I realized at that point that um, my American colleague was clearly totally aware of what she was doing. Uh, and that was a political communication with very wide impact. And, and not surprisingly, um, she didn't remain as a US ambassador to Qatar for very long after that. Um, I think, um, what else can I say? Um, balance is really important when using social media. Um, and I found that in Libya, where, where the country is to, in many ways, still um, uh, far from unified. And when I, as ambassador in Libya, gave interviews, I tended to have to do TV interviews with the Western uh, outlet, as well as separate parallel ones with the Eastern outlet to ensure balance. Um, so communication through modern technology is, is, is fraught, and it's a bit of a minefield, but it can produce greater transparency. And there are lots of good illustrations of how this new toolbox can be used well. And I think particularly about how the UN mission uh, in Libya used uh, online streaming of the Libyan political dialogue forum at uh, the uh, end of last year to, um, to gr produce greater transparency. So for the first time, all Libyans were able to see what the people who purported to represent them were saying about what they would do if they ended up in positions of power within government. They had to make pledges, visible, uh, which were visible, streamed online, live, uh, that they would hold to certain values and they would not, for instance, stand um, beyond a temporary uh, position of power if they were chosen by that dialogue forum to move forward with the political process. That was a really clever use of, diplomat of, of social media, uh, of technology to in, in build greater buy-in and understanding and um, greater transparency to a otherwise rather opaque um, Byzantine political process. Um, I, I, my experience overall is that this new toolbox is, is a positive, um, given, given, given the benefits can bring, but one has to tread, tread carefully. In Yemen, I held several um, Q&A sessions um, and also in Qatar with bloggers and others, um, live, interactive, uh, using virtual media, open to public um, viewing, and and I, I the feedback was positive, and I think we progressed understanding of of where the UK was coming from and a whole range of issues in the region. But at the end of the day, you're walking a tightrope, and you know sometimes in the UK also you've got to be very careful how things will play if you're a diplomat abroad, because there are no boundaries um, between what is seen within the country you're posted to and what is seen elsewhere in the world, including in your home country. So um, politicians do not always, elected politicians do not always welcome it when um, a, a diplomat um, serving abroad um, says something uh, or does something that is then replayed in the national domestic media. Um, th that, that is more of a sphere which is uh, generally uh, considered by ministers and governments to be for um, elected officials to be um, presenting and, and acting in. So, you know, you've got to tread very carefully. And I think overall, my, my sense after a decade of trying to navigate these shoals and difficulties, but get the best out of using the new technology uh, in the ways that Nagar outlined uh, are possible. I, I mean, I have a couple of uh, guidelines generally. Generally, I think if in doubt, less is more. So don't, don't rush to do too much of this stuff. Um, and discretion can often be the better part of valor. Now, um, a few thoughts on Samia's intervention before I open it up to the floor. And I, I do hope you're posting questions and, and thoughts as we go. Um, 
So I'm very strongly in agreement with Samia that uh, proxy civil wars um, characterizing um, very much the last few decades are much more complex and difficult to resolve uh, by diplomacy. And I've served in two countries, Yemen and Libya, uh, where that has been very much uh, in evidence. And of course, uh, it's serving in Qatar and Iran as ambassador. Uh, those are two countries which have also played uh, an active role beyond their borders um, in, in conflicts, um, both close to them and, and some further away. I very much recognize what uh, Samir said about um, Russia and Iran and how they cleverly mix uh, diplomatic cooperation with um, often with actions which in the eyes of the West often look uh, illegal and are certainly very disruptive and unhelpful to the cause of bringing greater peace and stability to uh, countries or the region. Um, there is a very important characteristic, which I think Samir brings out well in his chapter, about deniability and the point uh, he was making about uh, the Ukraine conflict when, um, with one hand, Russia is, is entering into negotiations diplomatically and the other hand is inspiring or supporting um, military uh, disruption and activism on the ground, uh, plays out in, in other theatres as well. And, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a tactic adopted uh, effectively uh, for their own purposes by both Moscow and Tehran. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, uh, serve the greater good in any way whatsoever, but it, clearly they evaluate that it serves their national interests. And they often use proxy groups. And the two um, that spring to mind, you know, Russia's use of the Wagner um, mercenary group in Libya, and the way that Tehran um, has built up and uses Hezbollah in Lebanon and elsewhere um, is a very good illustration of how uh, one remove um, countries can have very uh, serious impact and influence over uh, conflict situations on the ground. So how do we respond as a, a last thought? I, I mean, I think Western governments have a a choice really when they're faced with this kind of complexity and messy, very messy uh, uh, situations, which affect their national interests strongly. And, and I think we either have to choose to confront or engage. Um, there are of course, lots of gray areas in between those two poles. Uh, sanctions offer one uh, tool. Um, often sanctions appear to be perhaps more uh, effective when they are threatened rather than actually used although there are no doubt examples when the opposite uh, is true. Um, but I think it's also really important when facing uh, as a diplomat, the kind of messy complexity I've recently been dealing with in Libya um, to, to try and uh, evaluate what the various parties, international parties uh, really want. What is their national interest at stake? Um, and fundamentally, are they engaging in the way they are for tactical reasons or because of strategic interests? And I think um, what one could see is, for instance, in Libya, um, one might think that the Russian interest there is more tactical um, rather than uh, vital to their national security as perhaps their engagement they would perceive in Moscow, their engagement in uh, eastern Ukraine has been at times. Um, and I think, you know, just the last point before I, I open it up, there are strong parallels between all these uh, various conflict theatres and, and complicated situations. And I think it's great that uh, Dr. Puri uh, brought together the Ukraine and the Syria examples because um, we can learn a lot by comparing how major powers behave in in different, the different theaters. Um, so for instance, I think the, there are distinct parallels in my mind between the Minsk process as described um, by Dr. Puri um, and the Berlin uh, agreements are, are, are agreement on Libya, which um, was led by Chancellor Merkel uh, through two conferences in early 21 and, and uh, in early 20 and then in June 21. Um, I, I, I was at the, uh, both of those uh, with the UK delegation 
And um, I was struck, for instance, seeing the read across to what has been said about the Minsk agreements. Um, I was struck in Berlin in January 21, 20, sorry, January 2020, um, at the height of the civil war when in Libya, when um, the conflict was at the gates of Tripoli, when uh, from our compound embassy in, in uh, Western uh, Tripoli, we could hear the, uh, the shelling at night, uh, only about nine, 10 kilometers away. Um, I, I, but I was struck going to Berlin, sitting in a room with these global leaders around the table. On one side of the table, you had President Putin, another President Erdogan, and many other actors around the table, including, of course, uh, our own prime minister. And it was striking that uh, while that conference was actually agreeing, that summit was agreeing um, a path, a political roadmap, which is still being pursued through uh, in Libya to good effect through a um, ceasefire, which is holding, and through a political process. But while they were agreeing that, at the very same time, both Russia and Turkey were escalating their um, military support for the various Libyan factions and bringing in um, more forces, more weaponry, and um, in the short term at least, escalating the conflict. So this plays very much to Dr. Khoury's point about um, how proxy civil wars can play out in a multifaceted way, incredibly complex. Um, and although you know, I, I, I'm no, in no position to comment on the Minsk prospects for the Minsk agreement, um, but I'm at least glad to finish on a slightly positive note that the prospects perhaps for the Berlin process, pursuing to uh, a better future for Libya in due course, um, are, are still reasonable. And, are, and the diplomats on the ground, led by the UN effort, um, are still working very hard to, um, to make that a reality. So all is not lost. Diplomacy still has a very strong role to play. And, um, and I, that's why I think these books are well worth reading. And um, certainly I look forward to um, the, the comments and discussion uh, we're about to have. So um, that's enough from me. Uh, let's have a look in the chat bar and see what we got on the Q&A. Um, and Jonathan, if you'd like to come in and summarize anything that you've spotted so far, Professor Hill, um, Thank you. from the chat bar, the it open up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to abuse my position as, as, a, as, a, as a panel member to, to, to pose some questions. Um, just to, to re-emphasize what, what Nicholas has been saying, please post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom rather than the chat. But if, uh, if I may, I'd like to, to ask questions of you all. Um, uh, thank you very much for your, for your presentations and contributions. Um, and I'll, I'll ask the questions uh, of everybody together and then Perhaps if you could uh, each reply in turn, I, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll leave yours to the end, Nicholas, to give you uh, a, a, your your voice chance to recover. Um, so I'll start off by asking uh, Claire a, a more practical question. Um, you you spoke about um, uh, promoting debates, promoting questions. Who is your primary audience with these books, and are you intending to write follow-on volumes? Um, for Samir, um, I'd be very much like to know what you think the West should do about some of the tactics adopted by uh, Russia and, uh, and Iran. Did we get it very wrong in Ukraine and Syria, or are there things that we perhaps did that were uh, appropriate uh, and that we should look to repeat in other theatres should the need arise. Um, to Nega, I would be interested to get your thoughts on whether you think uh, regional governments are upping their social media games. We hear a lot about the importance of social media to protesters, but are local governments, local regimes, are they learning and improving their social media profiles and how they seek to use social media to promote their policies and also uh, win and, and maintain support. Uh, and lastly, if, if I may, Nicholas, I'd be very interested in your thoughts. I mean, looking at your, your own uh, career trajectory, you, you've served all over the world, but you've served as ambassador predominantly in the Middle East. 
Is that customary within the FCDO? Do people tend to focus on particular regions? And if so, do you think the Middle East and North Africa presents um, any unique challenges or opportunities for, uh, for, for diplomats, for ambassadors compared to perhaps other parts of the world? Thank you very much. And if anybody else has any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Should I go ahead? If that's okay, if we could um, go to the order. So, yeah. uh, so responding. Of course. Um, books are designed very want to highlight the importance of diplomacy, not only for an academic audience, but for the general public. And I might be biased, but I'd love to think that the chapters are all very accessible. They're all written in a way that I think anyone um, who has an interest in access, you really want to, we all should be taking interest in that has a role to play in our everyday lives. Um, with regards to the follow-up book, I'll admit that Professor Spence is keen to do more to his and his passion for academia. And I think what we would like to do is continue having these kind of dialogues, both with our contributors, with people who are interested. Um, with, we think that in such on so many issues that are so important and so relevant to today that it would be great to use them as a platform for wider discussions to bring in different actors to bring in different people who are stakeholders in diplomacy who have an interest in learning more about it and who want to be a part of it um, and if i may in my final um moments just respond to some comments as well by uh, nicholas and um, because i noticed that he mentioned that i'd suggested diplomacy was more reactive. Um, I think that might have been, um, I don't, I think that was something that might have been misunderstood from my comments and I know my internet is not very clear. Um, but we actually think that diplomacy is an imperative. It's something we all have to do and that actually by understanding all these issues, by being able to engage with the diversity and the breadth of topics that diplomacy covers, it will enable um, governments, policymakers, politicians to be far more proactive in dealing with them in as to the view in Britain our strategic horizons are far too short if we want to be good at strategy if we want to be good at foreign policy we have to have much better longer term vision and strategy for how we're going to navigate the world that goes beyond 10 years we need to be looking 20 30 50 years ahead and thinking about where does Britain want to be in the world Understanding these topics, it should make people more proactive, more active. We need diplomats. We need diplomats to be at the forefront. Second point on multilateralism as well. This is a theme that came up recurring, it's a recurring theme in the books, really, that we can no longer look solely to um, America or Europe to address the problems that we face, that we need to have an inclusive approach. Um, in diplomacy, when we look in particular at climate change, and we have one chapter um, on climate change, you need, you need indigenous populations to be involved. We need to be having inclusive dialogues that are not just about the major um, powers and the major actors setting the agenda, but where they're really open to listening to those who are um, struggling with these challenges at the very forefront of them and being able to develop a dialogue that takes everybody along and also learns from them. Because I think I'm doing interviews with diplomats right now, and it's interesting to look at which states listen and which states talk and how do we learn if we're in a state that does most of the talking, how do we learn to do more listening? And if we do more listening, how do we learn to have more of a voice? And how do we do that to have a far more representative um, international collaboration? Ultimately, I think it's what diplomacy should be about. In okay, shall I, John, was I, was I, was I next? 
John, thanks for the question. And Nicholas, thank you as well for, for your very stimulating feedback. Absolutely fascinating example of the Berlin process in relation to Libya. I was really struck by those parallels as you explained uh, your participation in that. Uh, John, with regards to your question, what did the West do well, if anything? Um, certainly maintaining diplomatic processes, even in the face of, of uh, low levels of progress is extremely important. And I certainly say that the UK government and its role in the OSCE in Ukraine maintained a, a dialogue between the conflict parties, even if that final resolution uh, was always elusive. But maintaining the dialogue does take effort. It takes diplomatic bandwidth. It requires representation both on the ground in the country, but also in this case in Vienna, in New York, in the, in the UN and elsewhere. They, these sorts of things are, are really important. But what about the things that didn't go so well for Western intervention? Well, the observation I, I give in, in my chapter is that actually the US in particular is largely sidelined in both the Ukraine and Syrian conflicts, um, partly because it had no hard power deployed in the conflict, not that I'm advocating that, but just to I think, round that off, both of these conflicts and indeed the world we live in uh, is still very much a world that's in the shadow of the Iraq war of 2003. And I think this has had quite a lasting impact on the West's ability to engage in certain ways in certain high stakes conflicts, not only in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world. Um, it's not so much about the credibility, I think it's more about the confidence within Western countries uh, to deploy combinations of hard power and diplomatic leverage uh, and to be able to, to drum up international support uh, around Western-led conflict interventions. Um, but that's, that's a very general observation. I don't want people to, to get the wrong, wrong impression to think that uh, the West can do, no, can do nothing that's positive in armed conflicts. But I would, if I was to make a prediction, I would predict that the West would be less unilaterally involved in conflict resolutions and conflict interventions would almost certainly have to assemble coalitions in, including those of local states uh, that are directly involved in the fighting or, uh, uh, around the conflict zones in order to try to achieve outcomes. And if nothing else, the Afghan conflict, I think, shows that there was, a, I think, a paucity of US engagement with some of Afghanistan's neighbors or maybe not very successful engagement with some of Afghanistan's neighbors, trying to do something yourself on the other side of the world to where you originate may not necessarily be the best sort of conflict intervention method. So I'll round off my answer there, thanks. Um, so just, just to quickly provide feedback to what Ambassador Hopton mentioned, I think, um, you know, and I can speak on behalf of Inga as we sort of talk through this chapter together. I mean, we definitely agree with your with your assessment um, in terms of uh, you know the social media toolbox. I, I do like to differentiate between using platforms such as WhatsApp and Signal um, as quite a bit of a different kind of communication tool that diplomats can use versus sort of it being uh, something where you're able to engage and announce um, to a larger civil society, a larger population, um, and being able to have a dialogue with somebody um, in a, a far a more remote part of a certain country or a region that you may be working with. Um, so sort of the, these older platforms such as Twitter or Facebook or whatnot allows you to have that engagement, whereas Signal and, and WhatsApp, for example, you need to have kind of that more direct communication or part of this uh, group chat um, as, as WhatsApp has become um, known for. Um, and, and, and absolutely agree. I mean, at times risks can be quite high. Um, so uh, given the fact that it's more immediate, it does reach out to, to a larger audience. And I think what many um, public diplomacy diplomats do spend time thinking about is, you know, who is your audience, right? To, to John's question, to Claire, like, who's your audience? It does come down to who is your audience and who are you trying to engage with? So what kind of tools you use in your toolkit, be it social media, be it um, 
um, you know, a, a TV interview um, or an op-ed placed in a particular journal. I mean, these are all part of, of those components. Um, I do think, and one thing that we do highlight in the chapter um, as we go through and, and provide sort of assessments and, and sort of an ethnographic kind of feel to, or qualitative feel um, in terms of questions that we've asked of, of current and former diplomats. I mean, one thing that needs to be done um, more extensively is kind of that, um, a bit of an m and &E, a bit more monitoring and evaluation of, of impact and what do these engagements mean in terms of true impact. Um, and not as much research has been, academic research has been done um, in that regard. Um, and whether, you know, uh, Tweet, you know, um, tweeting diplomacy has that true, what kind of impact that truly has. Um, John, to, to your point in terms of whether regional governments have been uh, taking opportunity in, or using the opportunity to engage with their societies using social media, um, uh, it's been it's been mixed, quite frankly, in the region. Um, we've noticed that in the Gulf, um, there's been very little engagement by um, by the countries with their citizens using social media, even though the percentage of social media uh, users in the Middle East is quite high. Um, I was trying to go back to our statistics um, to see what we had found. We had highlighted in the book chapter. Um, so for there was one example that the Saudis are the most active per capita users of Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, and Instagram globally. Um, yet you you don't see that sort of dialogue between the, the government and its citizens. So there is still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, but it's not in the same um, it's not on par in terms of users and, and engagement with the government. Right. Well, maybe I should come in last as, uh, in response to Jonathan's uh, question. Uh, but first of all, thank you, colleagues, for the uh, comments you've just made on, on what I said. Um, and and Nega, I think just picking up quickly on the point about different different platforms, different apps for different purposes. I think that's a really interesting angle um, that we could talk quite a lot about. Um, maybe not tonight, but it, it is an interesting angle. Um, and you know, for instance, I've always used Twitter. Uh, as a, as essentially a, either as a personal press release, of course, there's nothing personal when you're an ambassador, you're speaking on behalf of your government, but as a press release in my name on behalf of the UK government. Um, and sometimes it has effect. Um, I was pleased with the effect when I did a tweet uh, a couple of months ago, having visited uh, an appalling um, site of mass graves uh, in Tahuna in Libya. And um, I think I was the first uh, Western uh, ambassador to do that. And uh, being able to highlight that, highlight the, the potential war crime that had been committed there and the terrible situation and use Twitter as, uh, to do that. I found that a very valuable tool and the reaction to it seems to have justified, justified that. But then other platforms are clearly for more private or group, as you say, behind the scenes negotiation or, or communication. In answer to Jonathan's question, um, about the FC uh, DO, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Offices, as we now are as a merged department, um, and, and is there a focus on particular regions and does MENA present unique opportunities and challenges? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, traditionally, uh, certainly in my career, um, there has been a tendency for diplomats to develop career anchors, as they call them, um, areas of expertise. Um, in some cases, this is very obvious and repetitive, such as if you learn Chinese earlier on in your career, you're going to be going to uh, Beijing and, and other places in China, in the Chinese speaking world um, much more regularly. Uh, to an extent, that applies to Arabic as well. Um, there's a much broader range of posts and countries, obviously, to be posted to uh, if you have uh, Arabic. Um, language is, uh, has, again, has sometimes been more valued than at other times within um, the uh, Foreign Office. At the moment, it is now being valued much more, as is regional expertise. And that's my sense. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think 
MENA, Middle East North Africa, as a region with over 20 different um, uh, capitals to be posted to, uh, offers huge variety and um, challenge. Uh, and I think it does offer some unique opportunities as well as many of the other things that you can get by being posted to, um, to other parts of the world. And I think I would highlight, say just from the last 10 years, the experience of being posted to a Middle East country has probably been quite different in some respects from being posted pre-2010-11. Uh, and I think um, when, 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 when things were not moving <laughs> with such turbulence as they have in the last decade. In the last decade, I, I think for anyone interested in expeditionary diplomacy, sharp end stuff, uh, as a diplomat where you can really have an impact, um, where things are moving fast, um, and someone who has the resilience to put up with what can be very uncomfortable, even sometimes dangerous situations, um, MENA does offer something unique. And, um, and, and I know there are still uh, lots of diplomats at different stages in their career in Britain and elsewhere who are, who are attracted by that kind of uh, job challenge. So yes, I think for the right people um, with the right skills, the MENA uh, area does offer uh, a lot and will continue to because um, as, as I think a senior official told an incoming British minister in the 1950s, the, uh, the minister arrived in the foreign office and said, well, listen, I, I don't really want to spend too much time focusing on the Middle East. Um, so make sure that, you know, let, let's focus on the rest of the world. And this very wise senior official, as I say, this is at least half a century ago, turned to the minister and he said, minister, you may choose to ignore the Middle East but the Middle East will not ignore you. And I think that still applies. So Middle East is still a very challenging, fascinating, rewarding place to be a British or any other sort of diplomat. Thanks, back to you, Jonathan. If there are any other questions we should be picking up. Thank you very much. Um, we will we'll have a look at some of the questions in the, that have come into the, into the box um, and get your thoughts uh, on those as well. We've got one from anonymous attendee, um, and they ask whether diplomacy can involve the use of tools such as economic loans, even in the short term, even if it hurts everyone's business interests. Um, it, it, I, I leave it to to to, uh, to to the panelists to decide if they'd like to to, to comment. Um, economic sanctions. Um, are, can they be used by by diplomats and are they worth it even if it causes economic hardship in the short term uh, shall i posit a very quick observation on that john that would be super yes obviously sanctions are uh, uh, depends on which sanctions and which circumstance uh, it may not be the diplomat's judgment call to engage them, it might be a political decision, uh, and it may not necessarily be the diplomat's job to implement them either. Uh, this depends on the kind of sanctions, but I'll just give one clear example. Actually, from I'm, I'm sitting in Singapore, so this is more pertinent to the, the sort of issues I'm working on now. And that's the, uh, the fact that sort of economic sanctions can get mixed up with what we're sort of seeing described as a trade war. Uh, which is to signal deep political discontent between one state to another, that uh, you know, unreasonable tariffs are slapped onto goods. And the example here is clearly China and Australia, uh, which uh, is very much an, uh, an expression of Chinese discontent with Australian calls for a international inquiry into the origins of the uh, in Wuhan of the COVID pandemic. Uh, that was the final straw for Beijing. They then uh, basically uh, cut out the ability of Australia to sell wine, to sell, um, I think, some meat products and uh, other things that actually the Australian economy had gotten quite used to doing uh, to signal that discontent. That's actually some of the background behind the AUKUS deal, which I know uh, another questioner has, has actually mentioned. I won't go into that now, but staying with the point of sanctions, can they be effective? Um, I would, I, I, my, my view is that they're effective at signaling discontent they're not always very effective at changing behavior. And, and sometimes they're, they're the only tool that's left 
if you can't or don't want to, or it's clearly absurd to escalate to, to armed conflict, uh, but nonetheless, the actions of another state uh, are so uh, so so uh, causing so much grievance to, to to the other state that actually cutting off trade uh, is one option. And, and I guess the final point on that is targeted sanctions against members of a regime. This is the way that the West has tended to, I think, use sanctions more regularly. I think a lot of lessons were learned around uh, the sanctions that were used against Saddam Hussein in the 90s. Uh, that actually then cascaded into quite a lot of suffering amongst ordinary Iraqis. And since I've heard terms like smart sanctions being used, I don't like that term myself. The idea, the analogy is with the smart bomb. It's not a very good analogy, I guess, that's more directed. But you just look at the number of uh, Russian and Chinese officials who have some sort of sanction placed against them, asset freezes, travel bans. In the Russian case, maybe they've been involved in the Salisbury poisoning, attempted poisoning. In the Chinese case, maybe there are officials who are uh, identified as being involved in uh, the measures China is using in Xinjiang province against the Uyghur people. So there are very, very many sort of types of sanctions that can be used. Yes, I mean, you, you mentioned China. I, I guess one of the um, perhaps one unexpected corollaries of all this is that sanctions can also be applied to British and Western diplomats, as China now has against certain British politicians in response to uh, in response to comments and that they've made and actions that they've taken. So they they, they do work they do work both ways. Um, just Jonathan, I'm going to come in there if I may. Just please. is that okay? Just a couple of thoughts on on sanctions. Um, and I agree with everything that Sami has just said. Uh, I thought that was very astute. Um, and on the Salisbury. Uh, issue and Russia being targeted or individuals being targeted there. I think I think that was a good example of where a concerted diplomatic multilateral effort where the UK um, basically brought together a huge number of allies in, in The Hague um, and uh, managed to um, make very clear uh, what had happened and bring that pressure to bear on Moscow, um, highlighted the deep embarrassment that the Russian state will have felt at what was essentially a, a cocked up operation. And, and ultimately, of course, embarrassment is the thing that um, the present Russian uh, regime will, will find most uncomfortable. So it had a role there in, in different ways. In Iran, um, from my experience, I would say that it was a good example of how sanctions can work and how they can't work. Um, so before 2015, I think that uh, uh, economic sanctions um, played a, a big role in um, encouraging uh, Iran to negotiate constructively. And, and of course, there were many other factors which played a part in the 2015 JCPOA agreement, but it certainly helped. Um, and at the same time, when I was in Tehran, it was very clear to me this was not a country on its knees. It had not been brought to abject um, enslavement by uh, sanctions. This was a very proud, uh, in many ways, vibrant domestic economy uh, and international trading still going on of various sorts. So uh, one shouldn't over exaggerate the impact of pre 2015 sanctions, which were lifted uh, following the JCPOA. Um, at the same time, towards the end of my period, of course, there was a change of US president and um, unilateral US sanctions were reimposed. And in, in particular, the impact that had on the, the dollar economy, which, of course, is a fundamental um, way the world trades still, um, did have a, an impact. But it didn't, in my view, have the intended impact. And um, because probably because of the nature of the way these sanctions were brought about and the, and the unilateral way it was achieved, um, they, they tended to, I think we can see they had to a large extent the opposite effect and actually consolidated national um, national uh, resilience within Iran and uh, made the hardline elements in the regime's, regime stronger. And um, therefore, um, hopefully we will be able to return to a, a, a much more constructive phase of diplomacy with Iran uh, over the over this period and work is going on on that intensely, of course, but I think um, 
we the sanctions imposed after 2018 by the US um, did ha- set that back and probably had the opposite effect to what they're intended. They're a blunt tool. Um, as Samia says, they're, they're not that smart. Even when they're targeted and effective, they're still a tool. It's an evolving tool. Um, it, it's not a precise science. Um, they do have a place in the diplomatic toolbox, however. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, with that theme of evolving tools, uh, Inilowa has uh, posted a, a, a comment uh, which contains uh, a few interesting tidbits and questions, which I'm going to try and draw out now. Um, they note that the, the conduct of diplomacy has perhaps changed over time and highlight the roles that intermediaries can play uh, in uh, negotiations and in in resolving conflicts and difficulties. Um, If I can pose this question to you, first of all, uh, Nicholas, would the UK seek to perhaps use another friendly state to act on its behalf if it it was having trouble getting its message across to to a particular government? Or would it even be prepared to use a non-state actor, a non-state organization to um, act on its behalf in order to advance its interests, both in the short and and, and longer term? And the the simple answer is, of course, yes, Jonathan. And um, I can bring you an example very close to home. You know, when we uh, closed our embassy in Tehran, um, <clears throat> after the embassy was stormed, uh, we, uh, our interests in Iran, which are still very important, whether we're <laughs> whether on the ground or not, um, Iran is a very important country. We need to deal with it, even if we haven't got an embassy there. And uh, we, the Swedish embassy took uh, on our interests and um, did a very good job on behalf of the UK. Uh, the Swiss play a similar role for the Americans in, in Iran, uh, who has given that there is no US embassy there. So that's one example um, how uh, a close allied state can represent our interests in a country. And likewise, the UK can do that for, uh, for our allies, whether perhaps sometimes in the Commonwealth countries who aren't represented in a country uh, or for, for others. And when I was again in Iran, I was. Um, I wasn't exactly um, formally representing the Canadians, but certainly um, they weren't there. They'd also pulled out at short notice. Um, and, um, and certainly uh, I did what I could to support um, the Canadians uh, in their engagement uh, with the Iranian regime, even though they weren't present on the ground. So, yes, it does happen. It's a very accepted and useful uh, way of dealing with situations um, at one remove. Um, as a government through diplomacy. Great, thank you very much. Um, if I can change the focus slightly to, um, uh, to, to kind of draw in the other question that we have about um, the, the recent naval agreement between Australia, the UK and the US um, and its effects on, uh, uh, on, uh, on our relations with other countries. To what extent did you find during the course of your research that Middle Eastern issues were were affecting uh, essentially relations between different countries in totally different parts of the world? To what extent is the Middle East a sufficiently important area of activity that it shapes and colors relations across the globe? or was that sort of out with the scope of of your chapters and the volume more generally? I can just quickly touch on the fact that it was outside of the scope of of our research, um, which really focused more in terms of the the direct engagement between diplomats and and civil society organizations or or the government itself um, with its own own civil society. Um, But I think, and again, I'll defer to my my other colleagues on the panel who can unpack that a bit more. Um, So I'll leave it at that, thank you. 
Well, shall I add a couple of couple of lines there, John? Uh, certainly, in in, re in relation to the Middle East, maybe it's it, the Middle East obviously affects you know so much of the world, if nothing else, because of oil. Mina uh, has has an outsized impact for the, the size and especially the you know when you look at demographics globally, uh, you know some some Middle Eastern countries are not particularly highly populated in comparison to other parts of the world. Uh, but really, sort of in, in sort of the global economy, the Middle East is such a vital cog, uh, and also it's located. It's called the Middle East. I mean, it's it's located at the junction between several major continents. These are all fairly obvious points. I think in my research, I certainly found that countries outside the Middle East had a big impact in the Middle East, and this also comes down to well, how you do, you, do you, how do you define the Middle East? Uh, clearly, Turkey through the former Ottoman Empire. Uh, was one of the masters of the Middle East. And now whether you consider Turkey to be a Middle Eastern country or not is a debate that we, we certainly won't start because we'll never finish it because it, it of course has a foot in, in both Europe and, and the Middle East. Um, but just one last observation, John, on AUKUS very quickly. Uh, again, because it is something that's happened. It's a sort of big deal for, for some of the issues I work on uh, in this part of the world. Really is quite an astonishing uh, deal uh, and it's sort of like the return of the Anglosphere uh, in terms of a sort of, it's not even a minilateral grouping, but a sort of ad hoc tripartite uh, sort of issue specific uh, sort of arrangement between the US, the UK and Australia. Um, I'm, you know, some of you might have heard in my bio that I wrote a book about imperial legacies and the modern world. That's the last book I wrote. So I'm particularly interested in, in the fact that these, these are not necessarily pernicious legacies, but the fact that when countries, uh, politicians speak of like-minded nations, the, the root is actually sort of in, in common history and actually in common uh, imperial experiences, although they would never dare to articulate what those roots actually are, only that the imperative of balancing China, partly because China cuts off the supply, uh, the trade in Australian wine, amongst other things, uh, is such an imperative. But it, it, is, it is a fascinating example, I think, of of modern diplomacy that is not there's neither there's not multilateral nor unilateral but somewhere in between as an ad hoc grouping and i think that's an important takeaway for, for the audience that we're likely to see more of these ad hoc groupings around issue specific topics whether it's climate change or balancing a rising power or perhaps even a, a war that is unfolding without end these sorts of groupings i think may become more more common nicholas and others might have a different view uh, but I certainly think that some multilateral organizations and the UN I'm thinking of in particular, it's sort of nimbleness and ability to, to reach consensus, certainly in the Security Council, uh, is often quite disappointing. Um, to speak to the volumes of the Middle East, and I'll apologize, apologize. my internet is really patchy, um, and so I hope I come through clearly enough. Um, I mean, from our perspective, the Middle East is really critical to diplomacy. We look at what's going on now, we look at the continued um, conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, we look at what's going on in Lebanon, in Syria, Iraq, uh, the broader North African region as well, the Gulf. Um, it's an area that really poses so many questions that I think the themes of the volumes touch on um, when we talk about things like technology and social media, when we talk about proxy wars, when we talk about the interests of external powers in other states, um, climate change, um, the importance of negotiation, um, of commercial diplomacy, they're all feature within the Middle East. It's going to be, I think, at the fulcrum of international affairs for the foreseeable future. And it's something that I think all states really have to have an interest um, in engaging in and learning more about and understanding more about the Middle East. Um, and Ambassador Hopton spoke about the importance of Iran and shifts that might take place with President Biden now in office. You know, there's a real need to be able to address um, some of the challenges that we've seen in the past few years. And that's going to require um, multilateral um, engagement. It's going to require dialogue. Um, it's going to require engagement with civil society, with non-state actors to really find kind of common solutions and people address um, what, what the challenges are. So I think um, Negroninger's chapters and Sam's chapters obviously really focused on these um, in the volumes, but 
these themes um, are relevant to the region as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, Nicholas, any thoughts as to the importance of the Middle East to affecting diplomatic relations uh, and international politics elsewhere in the world? Yeah, um, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so I agree with what others have said. Um, I, you know, I, I'll, it comes back to the point I made before that, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, the Middle East is very, very close to the UK geographically. So that is why historically, uh, one of the reasons historically it's been so important for us for, for centuries. Um, and then more recently, of course, because of the energy uh, derived that we depend on. So, um, and even if that energy mix is changing, um, as uh, the UK government is leading the way, among others, to uh, try and encourage a shift away from hydrocarbons, and this COP26 uh, meeting in Glasgow soon will be extremely important and is, and is a very good illustration of how the UK, um, despite its uh, changed um, relationship with the, the EU, um, despite the, um, the challenge we've all faced with COVID, the UK still is determined to uh, play a very strong uh, global role uh, as a force for good. And, and that's just one illustration. Um, and I think you'll see more of that. And I think um, thematic issues will remain very important like that, um, thematic diplomatic efforts and events. But at the end of the day, you know, our near neighborhood remains um, Europe and the Middle East and uh, with a very strong transatlantic flavor to the whole thing and wrapped around by the Commonwealth and underpinned by our permanent seat on the Security Council. Um, all of these are very, very essential elements to how UK sees and will see the world for the time to come. I think the AUKUS um, agreement, as, as Samia said, I think it's a, it's a remarkable agreement. Um, it shouldn't be seen as threatening uh, by others. It's rather intended to uh, ensure um, security in very important parts of the world, which were looking like they were being threatened in some ways. Um, but also it's an illustration of how closely we can work and will continue to work with our most uh, important allies uh, on the most important challenges. So, um, sorry, a slightly long answer, but yes, the Middle East uh, will remain central to all of this because of its importance for our economic interests, um, the people-to-people -people contacts we have across that region, the his history that means the UK is still, um, despite <laughs> many critics, of course, and, and we must be aware of that and learn the lessons of history, but despite all that, the UK is often still seen as a force for, for good and uh, a, a neutral um, uh, mediator. That's the case in, in Libya, for example, um, as many see it. Um, and, I, and I think we have a role to play and a responsibility to play. And so long as we are at that top table, which we remain at as, as, a, as a global player, we should continue to exercise that responsibility and to do it uh, for the benefit of... of uh, good in the world um, and for the benefit of peoples uh, more generally, who, especially those who don't have a voice. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I'm afraid folks that we are out of time, so we will, we will draw stumps there. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers um, for giving their thoughts and to uh, uh, responding to the questions and comments that have been, have been put to them. Um, if you've not already bought your copies of the book, or the books rather, please do so as quickly as possible. You can't start your Christmas shopping early enough. If you don't celebrate cricket, if you don't celebrate Christmas by any way for presents, for loved ones, um, it, it's, a, it's a handsome volume. Um, so do judge a book by its cover in this instance. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the first event in the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies uh, program of events for this academic year. Uh, we have our annual conference next week on the 7th of October, which is Tracing Instability, Challenges and Change from Iran to the Gulf. So no doubt we will return to some of the issues that our speakers have 
raised and touched upon this evening. So do please uh, dial in for that. That is an all day event. Uh, it's free, it's open to everyone, so, so, so come along, so to speak. Um, thank you very much to, uh, uh, to Claire for giving a, an overview of the, of the volume, to Samir and to Nega uh, for presenting on their respective chapters, which touch uh, most directly on the Middle East. And thank you very much to Nicholas uh, for taking time out to come and speak to us uh, and giving us uh, insight into how all of these, all of these issues actually play out in uh, diplomacy today. We sort of get it straight from the cold face, so to speak. And thank you very much to, to you, the audience members, for, for dining in and for your participat participation. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much and good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.